Uh, I mean, sometimes I tend to joke a little bit or have a little bit of a sharp tongue, you know, because I grew up in New Jersey. What can I tell you, you know? <laughs> Everything is spoken in that way, kind of, kind of cynical and kind of joking and kind of sarcastic and wise guy attitude, you know. But uh, actually, it's not very respectful, you know. And so I try to, I try to always um, moderate my speech so that it's more respectful of people around me uh, and uh, this comes from good good breeding okay remembrance there are many symptoms of ecstatic love caused by remembering Krishna for example one friend of Krishna informed him my dear Mukunda just after ob observing a bluish cloud in the sky, the lotus-eyed Radharani immediately began to remember you. And simply by observing this cloud, she became lusty for your association. Mm -hmm. This is an instance of remembering Krishna in ecstatic love because of seeing something resembling him. Krishna's bodily complexion is very similar to the bluish hue of a cloud. So simply by observing a bluish cloud, Srimati Radharani remembered Krishna. One devotee said that even when he was not very attentive, he would sometimes, seemingly out of madness, remember the lotus feet of Krishna within his heart. This is an instance of remembrance resulting from constant practice. In other words, devotees who are constantly thinking of the lotus feet of Krishna even if they are momentarily inattentive, will see the figure of Lord Krishna appearing within their hearts. Yeah. I remember when I was, especially when I was in the woods, chanting, you know, 64 rounds or more every day, that when I wasn't chanting, I would be thinking of chanting. And this thinking of chanting has a, a different taste. It has a kind of very sweet taste of thinking of chanting. You know, I can't describe it. You just have to try it for yourself. It's like a kind of nostalgic feeling or mood. It's very, very sweet. It's very nice. Huh? It's like a delicate taste. So we should all taste these wonderful things. Argumentativeness. Argumentativeness, argumentativeness. Madhu Mangala was an intimate friend of Krishna, coming from the Brahmana community. Krishna's friends were mostly cowherd boys belonging to the Vaishya community, but there were others who belonged to the Brahmana community. Actually, in Vrindavan, the Vaishya community and the Brahmana community are considered prominent. This Madhu Mangala one day addressed Krishna in this fashion. My dear friend, I can see that you are not aware of the peacock feathers that are falling on the ground, and at the same time you are unmindful of the flower garlands which are offered to you. I think I can guess the reason for your absent-mindedness when I see your two eyes flying over to the eyes of Srimati Radharani, just like black drones flying to lotus flowers. <laughs> This is an instance of an argumentative suggestion in ecstatic love. You see how deep, how detailed this analysis is? We could take any page of Srimad Bhagavatam opened at random, and especially from the 10th canto, and take any verse or any incident in Krishna's pastimes and analyze all the rasas exhaustively. And that's how Sri Rupa Goswami wrote this book. And then he took that analysis and he arranged it, he organized it very nicely into different bhavas and, and different uh, emotions and classes of transcendental symptoms and so on. Uh, this isn't accidental. This is all drawn from Krishna's pastimes. The, the six Goswamis used to sit there under, the, under a tree and they had all these palm leaves. On each palm leaf, one shloka was written. And so they would take these palm leaves and then they would arrange them in different patterns. Uh, 
and analyze each one according to the emotion. Okay, this one goes in this rasa, this one goes in this rasa, this one goes here. Uh, and they had not only Srimad Bhagavatam, but many, many other uh, books as well. So let's see. Once while Krishna was out walking, one of the associates of Radharani told her, My dear friend, do you think that this walking personality is a tamal tree? The tamal tree is described as being the same color as Krishna. If he is a tamal tree, then how is it possible for him to walk and be so beautiful? Then this personality might be a cloud. But if he's a cloud, then where is the beautiful moon within? Under the circumstances, I think it may be granted that this person is the same enchanting personality of Godhead by whose flute vibration the three worlds are captivated. He must be the same Mukunda who is standing before Govardhana Hill. Very nice, poetic. Right. This is another instance of an argumentative presentation of ecstatic love. See, the gopis, they may have been simple cowherd girls, but they weren't stupid at all. They were very, very much aware of all these literary ornaments and metaphorical constructions and similes and different literary devices. Uh, so they were always talking in this way um, about uh, different analogies and different images and examples of different things to express their emotions. See, it's a poetic way of speaking that we hardly don't experience in modern times. In modern times, everything is, is one, everyone wants to speak very literally. Uh, this is the influence of this reductionistic modern science. Instead of uh, making nice word pictures to express our feelings, we're supposed to just express everything very, in a very cold and mathematical way. Uh, but that we're losing so much poetry by doing that. You know, really, we should, we should speak in uh, more poetic language. That would be very nice. Anxiety. In the 10th canto, 29th chapter, verse 29 of Srimad Bhagavatam, when Krishna asked all the gopis to go back to their homes, they did not like it. Because of their grief at this, they were sighing heavily, and their beautiful faces appeared to be drying up. In this condition, they remained without making a sound. They began to draw lines on the ground with their toes, and with their tears they washed the black ointment from their eyes onto their breasts, which were covered with red kunkum powder. This is an instance of anxiety and ecstatic love. One of the friends of Krishna once informed him, My dear killer of the demon Mura, your kind and gentle mother is very anxious because you have not returned home. And with great difficulty she has passed the evening, constantly sitting on the balcony of your home. It is certainly astonishing how you could forget your mother while you are off somewhere engaged in your playful activities. This is another instance of deep anxiety and ecstatic love. When Mother Yashoda was very anxiously awaiting for Krishna to return from Matra, Maharaj Nanda gave her this solace. My dear Yashoda, please don't be worried. Please dry your beautiful lotus-like face. There is no need for you to breathe so hotly. I will imme go immediately with Akura to the palace of Kangsa and get your son back for you. Here is an instance of anxiety and ecstatic love caused by Krishna's awkward position. So, are there any questions? Just a little question, Babaji. Is the mic on, Uruba? Okay. The queens don't know of 
Krishna's relationship with the gopis, of course. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, they do. Oh, yes, it's an open secret. Oh. Oh, yeah. Don't forget Subhadra. Subhadra is Krishna's sister. She's also Yoga Maya. Uh, and she was also born in Vrindavan. And Subhadra, of course, is present in Dwarka along with the other family members of the royal family. So Subhadra was always going on and on about how great Vrindavan was, see? And causing Krishna lots of embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> Little sister saying too much at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, then the, the, all the queens of Vrindavan wanted to meet the gopis and like this, but the gopis had no interest in coming to Dvarka. They felt like they would be out of place there. 